interaction as a therapeutic modality. As with other therapeutic modalities, its point is to create an environment that is conducive to healing. As with the other therapeutic modality, it is, it is not in place of a total treatment regimen and is considered not to be a, a standalone procedure. Throughout the course, we'll discuss the various influences that we can have on the biology, physiology, and the biomechanics of the human in particular with the skeletal system and the influence of the other systems associated with uh, the skeletal system, in particular the vertebral system, such as the central and peripheral nervous systems and dealing with the muscular system as well. Now, the three most common ways that we apply traction to the spine are typically manual, gravitational, and mechanical. Uh, the focus of this course is actually going to be on the application of mechanical traction. We will allude to or make comparisons to these other two forms, gravitational and manual. However, what we find is the reproducibility, uh, the efficiency, as well as the, the efficacy with some of these techniques can be a little bit more difficult in certain conditions as in, in terms of being done in the clinic as well as what can be done at home. Now we typically apply manual traction to the cervical spine as well as the, the lumbar spine. As you can see here, the patient is in a supine position. The therapist often makes contact at the base of the occiput and supporting around the mastoid processes. That way they can get good contact and support the, the head and be able to distract the spine. We will talk later about the amount of forces required for levels of distraction and actual separation of vertebral structures. This is somewhat possible. We are capable of doing so with manual traction. In the lumbar area, we find that we need to apply more forces and the separation of vertebral structures, as we will discuss, is going to be force dependent. So more difficult in the, in the lumbar spine. There are devices such as harnessing systems similar to what we see in the mechanical realm that we can attach to the patient as well as the therapist so they can be more efficient in terms of using their own uh, body weight and pivot points to apply the proper forces to the patient without being overloading to the therapist. We find that this is a, a difficult means of providing a lot of uh, traction treatments to a great number of people throughout the course of the, of the day. We'll also see and, and discuss the, uh, the comparison between the different types of traction and the reproducibility we find in manual traction is a little bit more difficult to quantify. Inversion gravity is something that has again been around for, for many years, similar with the, uh, the, the manual traction. Manual traction has been around and, and, and become a very popular component to many uh, manual therapists. Inversion gravity traction, as you can see in the, in the picture here, the patient is essentially elevated up off the floor and inverted. Using the weight of the torso and in the direction of gravity, that allows for potential distraction of the vertebral segments. As you can see, the position would be contraindicated for conditions such as hypertension just because of the increased blood flow to the cranium and the lack of opportunity to return blood flow uh, back to the heart and throughout the cardiovascular system, thereby increasing uh, the blood flow to the head and, and potential complications. Now we'd like to discuss the biomechanical and physiological responses to distraction, again, which were referring to as the result of uh, an application procedure using therapeutic traction. Keep in mind that these are the potential outcomes similar to when we were using electrotherapy where if we wanted we could get stimulation of smaller uh, diameter fibers that would result in pain modulation or we could adjust parameters to get uh, full titanic muscle contraction. Similarly, we do not necessarily get all of these at each time, but we can adjust our parameters to reach a desired set of outcomes.
So the effects that we find, separation of vertebrae, we find that this is force dependent. So you must apply a certain level of force that results in distraction or movement of the vertebral structures. We can also get changes in intradiscal pressure. And we found that this, is, this has been around for a couple of decades where if we separate vertebral structures, we could potentially get uh, changes in the intradiscal pressure. In fact, it can move from positive pressure forces to negative forces, creating a vacuum effect, which is where that term decompression comes from, and allowing for retraction of the nucleus. Again, being force dependent and going from positive to negative, we don't always necessarily have to go into the negative realm. It will be dependent upon the amount of forces that are going to be applied. Opening up of the lateral canal, we can do that unilaterally simply by performing lateral flexion. Uh, the benefit of maybe using traction is to get that bilateral. So again, that would incorporate movement of the adjacent vertebral structures, which is force dependent. Stressing or stretching some of these soft tissue structures. So stressing of the facet joint and the intervertebral disc. Same thing with stretching of the ligaments and the muscles that uh, stretching does not necessarily occur at end range. And when we look at the amount of movement provided by vertebral axial distraction, if we were to separate vertebral structures, is minimal and seldom will take us to end point with most of these soft tissue structures. Uh, likewise, we can, we can stretch below end point by providing uh, relatively low forces that result in, in certain outcomes. So by stressing the facet joints in the intervertebral disc, essentially just applying very, very low grade to higher grade stresses, distraction forces to some of these tissues. That is also similar with the intervertebral ligaments and, and muscles. However, the outcomes might in fact be different when we stretch a ligament due to its mechanoreceptor innervation and similarly with stretching of muscles because of their mechanoreceptor innervation as well as the other components that we find from some of the other systems such as influence on blood flow dynamics and lymphatics. could potentially relieve nerve root compression. Uh, this is a scenario where there's often an acute compressive force resulting from a soft tissue structure and or some sort of inflammatory response that is a result of an acute injury. The other potential is, is the removal of a disc herniation that is compressing a, a nerve root. Uh, in any event, separating the two structures that might be applying Compressive forces in that same direction would result from uh, separating those vertebral structures. And as I mentioned earlier, we could provide uh, enough force where if there's separation of the vertebral structures, instead of the typical bowing out of the intervertebral discs, by creating distraction forces, we can actually get a sort of bowing in effect that creates a negative pressure negative pressure system, thereby wanting to create a vacuum and interior movement of a potential disc herniation or the reversal of the, of the protrusion. We could, by moving the facet joints, actually move the synovial fluid, which is important for nutrient feeding of the, of the synovial joints themselves. Improving of blood flow to the disc, well, we find when a disc is healing that that's one of the constraints of healing, and, and we look at some of the theories associated with degenerative discs or why a disc fails to begin with is, is potentially lack of proper nutrient flow from the superior and the inferior vertebrae. We can also improve the blood flow to the surrounding muscles, uh, one as a result of decreasing any hypertonicity that may be found in especially the erector spinae, but also in the hip flexors. And when we look at the influence of traction on the lumbar region, for example, studies have shown that there's actually a change in the diameter cross-sectional area of the iliopsoas, uh, indicating uh, compartmental 
changes as a result of the difference in tension. Um, because of the tension that's applied to muscles, we know through various types of proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation techniques, we don't have to apply full stretch to a muscle that results in Golgi tendon organ response. It just needs to be held for a consistent time frame. So by applying a light stretch to muscle, isometric relaxation that employs this, this indication where applying uh, prior to end range with very, very low grades of tension actually suppresses motor neuron excitability. Uh, we can elongate all of the soft tissue structures that we find in the muscles, ligaments, and, and tendons, and also has been shown to actually deform uh, potential adhesions. In the case that someone may have had an injury at some point in time, resulting in, a, in an inflammatory response and scar tissue formation, especially if it has never been stretched before or treated, then the traction at higher intensities can be used to induce a creep effect or stretching deformation of soft tissue structures, so actually affecting adhesions and deforming, and many of those tissues run longitudinal fashion with the, with the spine, and that's the direction we, we typically want to stretch these in. Can we leave pain? We find that mechanoreception is stimulated from very, very low intensities to very, very high intensities, and, and that seems to be a wonderful indication in the use of traction in uh, stimulating mechanoreceptors at all different levels, which is why we find that we get pain modulatory effects not only during the acute phases and applications that are using very, very low intensities, but then also to the higher intensity. So for instance, if you have a patient who is being treated for chronic pain syndrome, that we know that stimulation of mechanoreceptors in the chronic pain can still be influential in suppressing pain at that level. 